part of this is thinking about the lessons for how to make it a bit more politically palatable, whether that is to compensate people who work in the coal belt, whether it is to give sort of lightning rods that mean that politicians can feel a bit freer to take these somewhat risky but long-term beneficial decisions. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. Electrification rates have grown in large parts of the world in the past two decades. The Indian experience in this context is particularly interesting. Indeed, with 98% of households now connected to the grid, India has achieved something remarkable. Hundreds of millions of Indians have now access to electricity. However, although almost all Indian households are hooked up to the grid, access to power is often unreliable. India also relies heavily on coal, which currently is responsible for almost 75% of electricity generation. According to the International Energy Agency, India will, over the next two decades, have the biggest share of energy demand growth, which at 25% will overtake the EU as the world's third biggest energy consumer by 2030. Meeting this increased demand will require a reliance on a variety of energy sources and weaning the country of coal. And then there is the politics of electricity reform. While electricity access in India has definitely increased, so have people's expectations. My guest this week is Dr. Elizabeth Chatterjee, who is an assistant professor of environmental history at the University of Chicago. Her research explores how non-Western energy histories disrupt conventional understandings of capitalist development, the social dynamics of climate change, and green political thought. Liz and I discuss whether and to what extent the idea of development is associated with electricity access, what India has done well to extend electricity coverage, recent reforms in the power sector and the role of public-private partnerships, India's heavy reliance on coal, and whether renewable energy is going to be enough to meet India's future energy needs. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Great to have you on the show, Liz. Welcome. I'm so delighted to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I was recently reading, uh, looking at the data, reading the state of electricity access in India, And I was quite astonished that almost 98% of Indian households are connected to the grid. For me, that was astonishing because I recall my childhood in the 70s and 80s. I recall voltage stabilizers and the power cuts and the load sheddings. It was like a routine thing. Every evening during the summer, the fan stopped working. You know, you were watching a TV program, watching cricket And suddenly, you know, it was just darkness. And it's difficult to imagine how things were then when I visit India as often as I do. Now, I I should say I haven't visited India for the last two years because of COVID. But what amazes me is that there's all of this, you know, increased use of air conditioners and fridges and all of this has skyrocketed in recent years. But at least in the big cities, power cuts appear to be a thing of the past. So before we discuss some of the challenges, what has actually worked? What has India done well in terms of promoting electricity coverage? Yeah, I mean, I think it is an astonishing achievement. As you say, since the turn of the millennium, half a billion Indians have gained access to electricity, which is, I think, one of the greatest achievements in the entire human history of of rural electrification. So that is an enormous success story. And both the present government and the previous one must take a lot of credit for really pushing that forward. 
underlying that as well is an enormous expansion in the amount of capacity as well in India. So the actual installed generation capacity, the number of power plants has quadrupled again since the turn of the millennium, which is pretty astonishing, although I'm sure we'll talk about the environmental side effects of that. And also we've seen a huge surge of private investment coming in. So actually almost half of that capacity now is privately owned for the first time. These are all huge success stories. I'd also add the completion of the national grid, something that's not super sexy, but has been really, really crucial in actually raising up the level of some states that were previous laggards. Now, of course, we can question each aspect of these. They're real question marks about financial stability, about environmental stability, and about the underlying data. Plenty of people would point out that lots of those households don't yet have 24-7 power by any means, and that many people struggle to pay. So there are questions around that figure. The government does like to trump it 100%, which does seem a tiny bit questionable. But these are all enormous achievements, both that spread of coverage, the sheer scale of installed capacity, the completion of the grid, and um, something else I'm sure we'll go on to talk about, particular achievements in the areas of renewable electricity as well. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking about all those years ago when I did field work in West Bengal, in Orissa, and I spoke with district development officials. It could be villagers, it could be local politicians. And the idea of development was often articulated in two ways. One was roads and the other was electricity. So before we talk about maybe some of the reforms that India has undertaken, at least the Indian states have undertaken, I wonder whether this idea of development as being directly related with electricity access, if that you think has helped Indian politicians to somehow push through reforms, to somehow be more committed than perhaps in other parts of the world? It's a good question. The association of electricity access with development is actually a really old one. So, for example, Indian nationalists like Meghnad Saha, the great Bengali astrophysicist, um, came up in the 1930s, 1940s with all sorts of scales showing that India and, and then China as well were at the very back of the world in terms of consumption per head of electricity. Um, and we see this kind of across the political spectrum really early on. And yet not terribly much happened for decades and decades in terms of rural electrification. So I'm not sure it's that there is something new about this equation with electricity and development. I think what has become really apparent is that infrastructure and infrastructural bottlenecks were seen as really key in hindering Indian industrialization. And I think it's actually often been the need to improve power for industrial users and urban users as much as to spread it around more generally that has really driven some of these big pushes forward. Um, rural electrification has lagged some of those other achievements. I'm very glad that it's now caught up. But one of the curious things is you haven't seen in India historically mobilizations by people who don't have access to the grid usually to get access to it. Are you talking about mass uh, movements or like protests for electricity? Is that what you're referring to? Right, right. So there is a rich culture of electricity protests, but it tends to be by people who are wanting to pay less or wanting better quality for the power they do have or who have had access to the grid and then, you know, equipment has failed. It's less been a popular mobilization to demand access by people who've been left out of the grid, um, which in and of itself is quite interesting. But, you know, with the, the big welfare schemes brought in by the previous Congress-led United Progressive Alliance government, we saw a big 
emphasis on rural electrification, lots of funding going to the states. And that has been really supercharged by the current government. I do think, though, that often the arguments have been about economic productivity rather than, you know, some great faith in the real glory of bringing power to everyone. My take on this is, at least in recent years, it's almost like everybody expects electricity. It's like, you know, the politician can't really talk about himself or herself as the savior bringing electricity because it's like it's it's almost taken for given. It's a necessity, which is very different from, say, another country that I do a lot of work in Malawi, where just getting access to the grid is a challenge. Even if you do have 10 percent of the population connected to the grid, these people won't have 24 hours of electricity. Maybe you'll you get, if you're lucky enough, eight or nine hours. So my sense is that in India, it's almost taken for granted. It's not some, it's not a big deal. Yeah, it's very interesting you say this because I heard lots of electricity officials actually complain about it, about this kind of hedonic treadmill of access to electricity. So often people will get electricity and, and you know, it will be for only 10 hours a day. And within about three or five years, they'll say, this isn't good enough. You know, we want a consistent <laughs> voltage. We want it round the clock. Um, and that this is a real, genuine, well-documented phenomenon that, you know, you start expecting more. And just as you say, you start taking it for granted. The goalposts keep moving then, as these bureaucrats would complain. Well, uh, they didn't even have a connection before. OK, the connection's shoddy, but now they're complaining about it. Now they're complaining about paying too much. Um, as a sort of an aside on that, I think that one of the really interesting phenomena that this is, expansion of the grid has brought about has been the death of microgrids in lots of areas. So the old off-grid, tiny scale, say, solar power solutions that you saw, for example, in the Sundarbans, the beautiful mangrove forests off Bengal, or part of Bengal, they have been driven out because people say we want what they say is the real power of the grid. It's not enough to be able to charge a phone or run a single light bulb. As you say, you do want goods like an air conditioner, maybe if, well, that's if you're a bit more middle class, but a fridge or a TV that you can watch without thinking halfway through your four hour long Bollywood film is going to run out of batteries. So this is a an interesting phenomenon that Actually, some of those old renewable energy solutions have taken the hit, too, because they they are, are seen as the poor man's power, whereas the grid is the real deal. Yeah, that's fascinating. So, you know, one of my first proper gifts to my parents when I returned to India, this is the early 1990s, was to buy an inverter, battery powered backup system. So every time there was a load shedding, Four ceiling fans and a TV and some lights in the house could be run for several hours. And this system actually has been working quite well for, I don't know, several decades. We haven't changed. I suppose they've changed the batteries every now and then. But now my dad was telling me recently that they don't use it anymore. So so he's worried that the system perhaps, you know, won't work when a load shedding does take place. So one is getting quite comfortable with how stable the system is. But returning to this post-1991 phase, Liz, that you've written about, the Indian state's activities, of course, have changed considerably since 1991. And there was perhaps an acceptance that state-dominated system was not working and that one needed to involve private sector actors about how there has been this hybrid public-private system, right? And, and some reforms have apparently worked and some have not. Some agencies have perhaps become more efficient, while other parts of India's power sector remains quite dysfunctional. What would you say has worked in terms of this private-public partnership? How effective has that been so far? That is a great and a very big question. And here, I think the lens of electricity does give us a bit of a, a different perspective on India's trajectory to, you know, more co conventional focuses on other industrial sectors, for example. Because I think what we see is, in some ways, the real high noon of liberalisation were in the years from 1991 through to 2003. 
when a very, very sweeping electricity act was passed that would have brought in a much more competitive market system, except everybody on the ground basically ignored it. And it's been in some ways, some of its key provisions have been a dead letter. And instead, we have seen, I would say, a real combination, as you summarize it there, of the private sector being grafted in alongside continued very pervasive state activity. So in in the power sector, we often talk about generation, that is the power plant side of things. And there, like I said, half of all generation today is owned by private players. And that is really where private activity has been concentrated. On the other side, you have distribution. That is the low voltage transmission of power to end users like you and me and, you know, your mom and pop businesses and this kind of thing. And there, it's very much state owned utilities that continue to dominate. And many of them are suffering under the burden of very heavily politicized setting of the tariffs for power and the kind of financially crippled. So we've got, you know, a, private players in one end making sometimes some money. We can return to that. But this fundamental distribution segment is very, very difficult to make profitable, is very, very tied up with politics. And private sector actors haven't really wanted to touch it outside some of the big cities. So is the problem there, Liz, that the private sector is not invited to be part of the distribution system? Is it because it is mired in, in, in politics? You want to be seen as the provider, you know, taking all the credit? Or is it because the private sector feels it is untouchable? This area is so controversial that it's better just to produce rather than distribute? So I think it's largely the latter This is known to be a very densely politicized sector, where, as you can imagine, it's really politically difficult to raise tariffs on, say, residential consumers who are pretty good at mobilizing, you know, often the urban middle classes and most famously rich farmers who get flat rate or nearly free electricity in quite a few states often that they used to then pump water in huge quantities to irrigate crops that they should probably not be growing in in arid areas. And again, it's politically very, very difficult to raise tariffs on those groups. Um, Because this is seen then as such a politically sticky wicket, many private players have not wanted to get involved unless it's on very particular terms. I mean, and in this as well, they're also looking at historical experience of players that have got into, for example, distribution in in Orissa, the poor eastern state, and their attempt at privatisation went really disastrously wrong in the 1990s. Everybody felt pretty burned. So there are a few exceptions. Delhi is very notable that it is privatised. And of course, privatised utilities survive in your hometown of Calcutta and Mumbai and and so on. But it is seen as a very dangerous sector to get involved with. There are some sort of franchises, but there the private sector tends to be quite shielded from the risk of actually setting those tariffs. And we should also talk as well about actually the private sector's involvement in building all of these new power plants as well, which the state has shepherded in over the last 20 years and has also gone in some ways, very wrong, even while it's managed to install huge amounts of capacity. India, if you like, has been in a long, slow-burning economic crisis for a decade. And I think that the power sector is really at the heart of that. In terms of, say, current and future energy needs, India has a lot of potential, but there are also challenges. So India is apparently the fourth largest energy consumer in the world, behind China, the US and the EU. And I was 
recently reading the India Energy Outlook for 2021, this report that was released by the International Energy Agency, IEA, in February of this year. And according to that report, in the next two decades or so, India will actually have the biggest share of energy demand growth, which at around 25% will overtake the EU as the world's third biggest energy consumer by 2030. By 2040, according to this report, India will actually double its energy consumption as the GDP grows. Now, it also turns out that although the pandemic has slowed down this energy demand in the country, India's dependence on oil and coal is actually supposed to increase sharply in the next few years. And you know, I'm interested in renewable energy, and I know there is a lot of attention on renewable energy in India. But what I find intriguing is that a lot of analysts say that renewable energy is not going to be enough to meet India's energy needs. And there have been all kinds of government policies, there have been you know, ambitious policies, but apparently oil and gas production has been stagnant for years, which also means that India is going to be more reliant on fossil fuel imports from other parts of the world to meet its energy requirements. So that was a bit of a longish introduction to my question, Liz. I'm trying to get your take on current and future sources of energy in India. Where do you think India is heading? Because on the one hand, there is growing talk about renewable energy, but on the other hand, the reality appears to be much more reliance on fossil fuels. Yeah, I mean, this is a balance that the government of India has been quite upfront about that they envisage both the fossil side and the renewable side continuing to grow in tandem. Um, Setting aside that our current debates about should India put forward a net zero target, which might change some of those calculations. But really, this has been pretty explicit that India believes it has a right to continue to develop oil, gas, coal alongside renewables. In terms of renewable energy, there is a lot of good news that has come out of India. I mean, there are these very eye-catching targets for 175 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2022, by next year, and by 450 gigawatts by 2030, which is just absolutely enormous. That's more than the entire installed capacity at the moment. And those targets will most likely not be met, certainly not next year's, but they're has been a huge amount of investment in solar, in wind. India is now the third largest uh, solar market, for example, behind the US and uh, China and the US. So these are all great signs. I mean, if you talk to people involved in the renewable energy sector, they will say there are huge dark clouds on the horizon as well. They complain a lot about the government's volatility in setting policy, for example, This enormous set of targets, a big round number, 100 gigawatts of solar that is targeted for next year, have meant that India has become increasingly dependent on imports of solar components from China. The government then belatedly became very uncomfortable with this and is trying to encourage domestic manufacture in ways that have unsettled all of the players in the sector. Plus, there are all of these big problems that I've just talked about, the politicized tariffs that mean your biggest consumers, your monopsonist state-owned utilities are not very good at paying their bills on time. And there's the fact that India's economic growth has been really not great long before COVID, since about 2012. So all of these are dark clouds on the the solar and wind horizons, but there, there is a lot of good news there. India really is a big solar player. On the other side, though, yes, there is an enormous dependence, especially in the power sector, on coal. And that looks pretty likely to stay for a whole number of reasons. Lots of the coal plants are quite old. That means because they're amortized, they produce power very quickly. Huge amounts of the east in the coal belt, the huge state-owned beer moth, Coal India, which is the largest coal miner in the world, employs 
vast numbers of people, both directly and indirectly, and historically has provided lots of welfare to those areas. And these are not areas where you get a lot of wind. They're not areas that are necessarily that sunny with a lot of spare land for solar. So what's going to happen to all of those regional economies is a big question. And then I think something that people have not paid too much attention to, but is really important, oil, gas, coal revenues are the big patch in both the central government and state and lots of state government budgets. So perhaps, you know, as much as a quarter of New Delhi's budget is based on its oil and gas taxes. Lots of those eastern states really rely on coal revenues as well. Again, what is going to fill those gaps? So there are actually very powerful forces holding coal, oil and gas in the mix. And you can see this, you know, the Prime Minister's Independence Day speech just 10 days ago really played up on one side, climate goals, talked about India set up the International Solar Alliance, which it's very proud of that it's going to go for green hydrogen and on and on, but also said we envisage an energy independent gas based economy. You know, so again, we see this very explicit argument that India has to do both, that it needs to diversify, that for poverty alleviation, it needs cheap power, even if it's dirty, as well as pursuing renewable energy. So it's, I have a lot of sympathy for this balancing act that New Delhi is trying to do. I was thinking about solar power and again, using my family as, as an example here. I mentioned to you how I gave them this gift of an inverter. And I was thinking, you know, maybe we should install solar panels on their roof in Kolkata. There's an abundance of solar energy. You know, I was trying to look at various alternatives and it was so difficult to navigate this terrain and whatever was available, this is 10 years ago, just wasn't good enough. You know, using your Sundarban example, it was just, you could run a couple of fans and a TV, not the AC. So it just didn't seem to be very feasible. So that got me thinking, and this is something that I'd like to hear your views on, one take I had then was that solar energy was just not packaged in an attractive way for the middle class. You know, if if all our neighbors in Salt Lake City, Kolkata, if they all, and they all have these big roofs, if they could install something, you know, that was subsidized, solar panels, that would make a huge difference. It was just so difficult to, to access this. And 10 years ago, the discourse on solar energy was it seemed to me it was more catered to the rural masses, you know, to charge phones, to have a solar cooker and that kind of stuff. It never seemed to resonate with the middle class. I think you're really on to something. As I said, I think I mean, the first designs for a solar cooker in India go all the way back to 1877. And the country was a real post-colonial pioneer in research in solar energy. But as I mentioned before, as this sort of poor man's energy, a set of small scale rural solutions that were never going to be all that appealing to the urban rich. That has completely switched around as the grid has reached rural areas. And you're completely right. Now there is a lot of talk about rooftop solar in particular. In fact, that big headline 100 gigawatts of solar target includes a whopping 40 gigawatts of rooftop which the country, I think it's about six now, it's going to massively miss. And that is no accident. Actually, it's really interesting you mentioned the case of Calcutta because West Bengal has really illustrated this trend. It was a real leader in rural solar in places like the Sundarbans. And now it's very hostile in lots of ways to renewable energy for quite sensible reasons. So Think about about your parents. Maybe they live in a nice residential, say, colony building. They are probably some of the few customers alongside, you know, industries and commercial users, perhaps, that the utility can rely to pay quite high bills because there's a lot of cross subsidization of rural areas and the poor. And they are actually going to pay them on time. The quality of power really matters to them. Now imagine that they have their own 
panel and all of a sudden you're losing that really great lucrative customer. So this is what utilities around the world, but you know, and this term has traveled to India as well, called the utility death spiral that they fear. That all your good customers start leaving for their own power. And to add insult to injury, when they have too much power, they want to sell it back to the grid. But they also want the grid for when, you know, it's not sunny during the monsoon, say, or at night. And this leaves then the the utilities themselves serving an ever poorer consumer base. And, you know, they're already pretty in bad financial straits. So this looks pretty dire to them. For this reason, then, they've actually tried to block um, rooftop solar quite explicitly in quite a lot of areas of India. West Bengal has also very much slow walked this. So it's just, it's been an interesting transition. Solar energy in this decentralized way has gone from this poor man's power in rural areas to this menace precisely because it's richer urban areas that are expressing interest in it now. But what it's mean, it means is that German style mode of having loads of decentralized rooftop solar generation is basically off the table at the moment in a meaningful way in India. But again, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for the utilities that they look at their bottom, their bottom lines and they say, what are we going to do? We have to try and muddle along in terms of prof- profitability whilst trying to meet at the same time some of these big goals coming down from New Delhi, these big targets that actually really threaten them existentially. Let's return to India's dependence on coal, which again fascinates me because I was reading up on this and I found that Indian coal power capacity has actually doubled in the last decade. And apparently the coal pipeline is the second largest in the world. Coal is also the largest source of electricity production in India. In 2010, I have some figures here in front of me. Coal-fired power capacity accounted for 65% of the install capacity mix. And in 2020, this was almost 74%. And coal-fired power plants operate in almost every part of India, most Indian states. Most of it is, of course, concentrated in the eastern states, like Urissa, West Bengal. We've been talking about Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand the so-called Indian coal belt. You mentioned this already before as to why there is this reliance on coal. And I was looking at some of the recent research on the political drivers of coal in the power sector. And it turns out that the real reason is India's political economy. It is extremely important, coal mining for India. It provides a huge chunk of revenue to the central government in Delhi in addition to revenue to all of these state governments. And then you have, I think you mentioned some of the state-owned enterprises, you know, Indian Railways, the largest employer in the country. They all have this kind of a vested interest, right, in continuing with coal. So, so I wondered if you could elaborate a bit more for the listeners on sort of these political drivers of, of coal. In addition to what I mentioned, you know, is there anything else that we should be thinking about? And I'm particularly interested, Liz, in understanding the kind of political debates going on in India in terms of coal or, you know, abandoning coal. Because in in many parts of the world, including the UK and Germany, they're shutting down coal-fired power plants, whereas in India and China, they still enjoy a lot of popularity, right? No, completely. And for some of the reasons that you lay out, you know, the revenue needs, For example, Indian railways very heavily cross-subsidizes passenger fares, which are very cheap, as anybody who's visited India will know, by coal freight, um, employment generation, and so on in the coal belt. But I think there is another side of the story that is really interesting and much more dysfunctional that it's worth spelling out because I think a lot of those employment revenue factors are quite familiar to, say, listeners who are based in 
even say West Virginia, say in the United States or something like that. What's really interesting about this huge surge that you laid out in the amount of coal capacity is what have been the broader political economic effects. And the fact that India is in then something like an early throes of the pain of a transition away from coal, but for all the wrong reasons. So basically, in the early 2000s, as I mentioned, you know, this path of ever greater liberalization just stopped looking all that appealing. And instead, the government of India took it upon itself to catalyze private sector investment in infrastructure. And it did this through lots of ways, but especially its control over the financial system. You know, about two thirds of assets are still in state owned banks, which is enormous. This is, you know, a statist financial system that rivals China's, I would say, in some ways. And there are a whole host of other government financial bodies that were just pumping money to any private player who wanted to get into coal. The other part of this was the discretionary handout of coal blocks for mining uh, on a very opaque basis that went on during these years. And so basically every Tom, Dick and Harry started pouring in and deciding they would build a coal fired power plant. Because at this point, through the 2000s to about 2011, 2012, the Indian economy was growing really quickly, you know, eight, nine percent. And so the, the projections for the growth of electricity were very quick. So in comes this binge of investment from the private sector. But it's funded largely by state money in the public banking sector. Now, a whole lot of things went wrong for India. Part of it's international, you know, the global financial crisis and then the so-called taper tantrum when the US Federal Reserve cut off spending. That really hit Indian exports, hit India quite hard. But also all of these scandals started hitting the government. The biggest one of all around coal, the so-called Colgate scandal that broke in 2012, when everybody said, hang on, you've been handing out coal to all of these people without any checks and balances. And, you know, the result of this then was to paralyze the policy process. Eventually, the Supreme Court actually revoked all of those handouts of, of the mines. So what happened then is you've got loads and loads of coal fired power plants all coming online, just as the actual demand in India started to slump. And India went from being a country that, as you described of your, your memory, that had a big deficit in power to having what looked like a glut to far too much coal fired power. This has been catastrophic for the private corporations. So, you know, the, the big name that everybody always talks about in Indian private, the private sector is Ambani of Reliance. But of course, there are two Ambani brothers. One of the younger Ambani brother who got into the power business actually had to declare bankruptcy not too long ago in London in what was the largest destruction of shareholder value in Indian history. And he's just one of a number of these big private players who poured loads and loads of resources into coal-fired power plants and are now scuppered. But this, the worst side of this is all of those debts that they have are in the hands of the state banks. So this has also paralyzed private investment and public investment simultaneously, sometimes called the twin balance sheet problem. So in this way, you know, the slow growth that India has faced over the last decade really is in lots of ways about the power sector. So why am I telling you this? I mean, firstly, I think it's interesting that the electricity sector is dragging down the whole Indian economy via these all these debts. But secondly, it shows how troubled coal power is at the moment. Banks and other players do not want to fund new coal-fired power plants. There are already too many of them. Lots of them are running at very low capacity, are struggling to get coal from Coal India, which still does dominate the mining. Um, and this means that, you know, we do actually see that fossil fuels are a bit less attractive than we might think. So we should balance these two things. On one side, there are all of the political economy factors we talked about, employment, revenues, and so on in the coal belt. But on the other, 
there really are very big problems in this thermal power sector that mean if I were an investor, I would certainly not be getting involved in it right now. So, you know, bad for the Indian economy in the short term, but possibly good news in the longer term. That's a very good point, Liz, because I've noticed how the Chinese in their investments, say in Africa, recently they pulled out of financing and building a coal-fired power plant in Zimbabwe, the Sengwa power plant, which surprised me because they had actually just last year said they would. And they, they had, I think, even begun constructing it. So there is this movement in, in many parts of the world. And it turns out that Beijing isn't very keen. And they've been criticized for, for this, for, for having supported and financing these polluting power plants. I'm thinking also about my own country, Norway now, and some of these debates are uh, somewhat similar and yet maybe a bit different. We have a general election next month and there's been a whole lot of attention in the election campaign, especially the last two weeks on the latest IPCC report that recommends, you know, us abandoning the search for for, for fossil fuels. And, you know, we, we rely heavily on uh, income from offshore oil that has made this country extremely rich. And some of the green parties now are arguing for an end date for, for oil. We should stop pumping out even more offshore oil. And it turns out we've only utilized half of our oil reserves. But, but the youth and many organizations are saying that we should just leave these untouched that we have made enough money from dirty oil and we've polluted the environment and we should actually set an example. The counter argument, again, in politics from certain political parties, at least on the right, has been a small country like Norway. Yeah, you know, we do produce two, three percentage of, of the oil in the world. But if we stop, this is not going to make much of a difference at the global level because you have countries like China and India and, of course, the U.S. that will continue to rely on oil. And they'll be happy to just get their supplies from other countries. I remember a conversation I had with Martin Wolf from the Financial Times last year, and he was arguing that the real problem isn't what we do here, whatever you know we do in terms of changing our consumption, etc., will not matter until India and China really make, you know, certain changes in their policies. But we have to also be aware of, this is Martin Wolf's argument, many of these countries still have large groups of people in their population that live in poverty. And that emissions per head of these groups, including most African citizens, is relatively low. So the point here is that no country in the developing parts of the world would be willing to be locked into this kind of unequal emissions per head as at the cost of permanent relative poverty. So while we try to persuade all these stakeholders on an effective, fair global plan of action, we should also prepare ourselves for some sort of heroic adaptation and crises. How would you see this from an Indian perspective, all these debates going on in, in Europe, in the US, on... Um, cutting our reliance on fossil fuels, moving on. Are they amused to see this kind of debate going on here? Or do, can they relate to it, some of the Indian politicians? Yeah, it's a great question. And the Norwegian example is just so fascinating as well. I mean, India, until basically the Paris Agreement in 2015, was very, very much committed to the idea that historical responsibility and per capita emissions were the key determinants of who should act. Um, and that's still a big, powerful thread in Indian climate policy. So to that extent, you know, about time, you know, that these rich countries that are incredibly energy intensive start to act. I mean, it's, I think it, from India's perspective, it's terribly unfair and detrimental that it is forever bracketed with China in these conversations. I mean, the Indian per capita emissions are half of the global average. China's are well over about three times as much as India's. You know, so these are two really, really different economies in lots of ways. China is much wealthier. It's, you know, what, 28% of worldwide emissions now. India still is, it has an extraordinarily long way to go. And I think this really does shape the conversations. You know, it's the reason why China has been perhaps willing to talk about a net zero target in a way that I think would be 
a little bit more perilous for India to do. Can India say that its emissions should peak right now when actually, as as you've just said, so many people's energy consumption is very, very low. They've only just gained access to modern energy for lots of things. So I think this shapes in lots of ways the Indian take on these debates. Instead, though, India is offering itself up as a different kind of leader on climate change. So the key word here that uh, first academics and then Indian policymakers took up was the idea of co-benefits. That sure, you could do climate friendly things if they had developmental benefits. And here, I think, is where we see solar energy being so appealing that it allows you to kind of square this circle, seemingly, of energy and environment. I mean, it has all sorts of environmental problems that we sometimes overlook. So India is very, you know, very much putting itself forward, both in Paris, both with the International Solar Alliance and so on as a different kind of leader that says, you know, we're going to try and leapfrog past some of the worst parts of Western style development. But, you know, it's not on us to make these intense cuts. You know, in some ways, it's a bit like the Western degrowth people say, where they say the West needs to stop and actually shrink. But they do admit that countries like India actually do require carbon space for continued growth. And that is a position I have a lot of sympathy with. Let's move on to one final set of issues. I know that you've studied the politics of electricity reform in India, in West Bengal, the East Indian state of West Bengal, which did not follow the typical World Bank template for electricity liberalization. And what is particularly interesting here is there is considerable interest in many parts of the world, including in sub-Saharan Africa, to better understand how power sector reforms can become more effective. Because in many of these countries, the power sector appears to be underperforming despite market reforms. So for the listeners, could you very briefly tell us what did you find in West Bengal? How did they approach reforms differently from the typical World Bank template? And secondly, what lessons do you think West Bengal offers to not just perhaps other Indian states, but also for countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America? Well, so the World Bank template, which is, you know, a a kind of framing that the World Bank itself has rejected, and they're very chagrined and have really moved away from this, was built on a lot of rich world experiences that suggested, you know, in the mode of, say, Margaret Thatcher's UK, that the best way to improve power sector efficiency was uh, a set a policy prescription for unbundling previous uh, mono- vertical monopolies, privatizing them, deregulating, well, and re-regulating on the other side to introduce competitive markets with lots of private participation. And that is a template that was rolled out across the world, the, gro- the global south, and has not done terribly well, really. So this is why I was so interested in what West Bengal did differently, because at least for a window of time, it seemed to have been a state that had really improved its management of power, cutting down levels of electricity theft, which are extraordinarily high in India, and so on, without doing this mode. So what did it do then? Well, West Bengal's reformers did have a shared vision with the World Bank in one way, which was this idea of insulation, which is Quinn Slobodian has pointed out, insulating things from politics is actually a nice, it's an electrical metaphor. But rather than doing this by bringing in market discipline and independent regulators, they decided to do it by strengthening the state owned utility and making it much more independent. Now, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, this has had some, you know, it has proved a little less sustainable than we would like to think. There has been a lot of populist pressure placed back on it. But some of the measures they took 
which really consciously imitated private sector forms of governance, like independent board members, like um, very, very clear performance standards, like prof uh, prioritizing profitability very heavily in order to guarantee independence from the state government. Some of these look like quite sensible ways to preserve modes of state ownership whilst taking some of the best lessons from the private sector. So you avoid the thorny issue of privatization, but you're bringing in some of these lessons by the back door. I think this is a really interesting model in lots of ways, partly because the World Bank template is so discredited, but also because if we look around the world today, you know, I, I work a lot in uh, environmental history, uh, climate politics and so on. You know, everybody's image is that it's big private corporations like ExxonMobil who are the baddies, which is true. They are villains of the peace. But if we look at the biggest 20 firms most responsible for emissions since 1965, 12 of them are state owned and are headquartered outside the West. So if we are actually to be a bit more realistic about this, actually state owned enterprises are really central to the energy environmental crises that we face. And we need to think a little bit more about how they can be run in ways that prioritize long-term goals like efficiency over short-term giveaways of you know, subsidized fossil fuel energy that leads to all sorts of over irrational overuse, like in India's case, pumping way too much water and you know, precipitating this this water crisis that I'm very worried about. So I think that the West Bengal model shows that there is a path forward for some of these state-owned enterprises to tread that is about more professionalized and autonomous management, for example. Um, and actually that politicians kind of like this in some ways because they, they want to tie their own hands on some of these issues. They don't necessarily want to be locked into big giveaways of energy, but they feel a whole lot of political pressure to do so. So actually, there is an interesting sort of coalition of interest that can get behind this kind of long termist reforms without going down the road of privatization and on and on. So this is what really, really interests me about that model. Although, you know, I don't see any signs of everybody turning around and heading to Calcutta for advice at the moment. What fascinates me about this is that, you know, on the one hand, there are lots of studies that show that without political interest and commitment, a policy is bound to fail. You really have to have political ownership. But on the other hand, what you describe is also interesting in the sense that, let's say, politicians are somehow relieved of their responsibilities or not directly involved. It's also a very useful thing for them then to blame the regulator or some other agency for potential failure. So they, they don't have to cop all the blame. They can deflect the criticism. So I suppose there are elements of both, right? So you want to be involved somehow, have some ownership, and yet have some sort of independence that could be useful anytime things go wrong and you have somebody to blame. Oh, I think that's a very per, you know perceptive observation. I do think that many more politicians are not credit maximizing, but blame minimizing. You know, they are, you know, they might be a bit keen to take credit, but they are even more so to, you know, dodge the bullet when something goes wrong. And you're completely right. This kind of autonomy then gives them something to scapegoat as well. But, you know, this is what is necessary. We have to be honest that the energy transition and all sorts of other reforms, like just making the power sector more efficient, it creates losers as well as winners. And those losers are going to be irritated. So but part of this is thinking about the lessons for how to make it a bit more politically palatable, whether that is to compensate people who work in the coal belt, whether it is to give sort of lightning rods that mean that politicians can feel a bit freer to take these somewhat risky but long-term beneficial decisions. So I have to ask you one final question, Liz, and that has to do with the so-called Gujarat model, which has received so much attention because India's current prime minister, Narendra Modi, was the chief minister of the state of Gujarat. And 
and he was credited for for developing the state very quickly. And in your work, you have tried to, I suppose, also contrast the West Bengal model with the Gujarat model. Could you highlight very briefly the, the similarities and differences? What worked in Bengal that didn't work in Gujarat and vice versa? Yeah, so the Gujarat model, as it's typically understood, is, uh, if you like, growth without development. It's characterized by very close state business relationships, but is seen as prioritizing GDP growth and elite interests over welfare spending. I think if you actually look at the energy sector, you get a little bit more of a nuanced picture than that. So what I try to show is there are actually some surprising similarities between supposedly pro-business Gujarat and supposedly, you know, long until 2011 for 34 years ruled by a nominally communist party, West Bengal. And that is in the area of heavy state intervention in Gujarat. Actually, the crowning jewel of the model for many people within India, though overlooked by scholars from the West, have been its power sector reforms. And they are very similar. They've prioritized utility autonomy, process type reforms over privatizing the utility itself, even while bringing in lots of private investment on the side. So I think that those similarities are quite interesting. And again, it suggests that there is a path through what Modi himself called a third option between privatization and state ownership that's rooted in autonomous public sector management. Now, where I'm way less sanguine is if we look at the other sides of the Gujarat model, the state has really heavily promoted this petrochemicals and gas development economy alongside solar energy, which is uh, environmentally devastating as well as having these well-known features of increasing inequality in the model as a whole. And I also think that we have overemphasized the smoothness of the relationship between the state and business. To me, it's very clear if we look at the present government in New Delhi and reflect back on Gujarat, that the state is in the driving seat and actually big business doesn't always like it. I don't know if you spotted about a week ago, the uh, Commerce Minister, who actually is the former Energy Minister, went on a 19-minute rant about how Indian industrialists are not serving the national interest, primarily directed at the Tatas, I think. So what we see here is, you know, it, it people have started talking about authoritarianism and so on. I probably wouldn't go that far. I would say an illiberal, very statist government is in control at the moment. And it has tended to, as the Gujarat example shows, it's tended then to sometimes lead in really quite, you know, sinister social, environmental and even economic dimensions as well. So although we talk about it as a model, I, I, it's definitely not a model that I think should be taken up wholesale by any extent. I think it has all sorts of quite worrying flaws in it. But nonetheless, it, it, it's sort of interesting. And those achievements in, in sectors like electricity and solar energy, we do have to weigh up against the really notorious, dreadful things that uh, have gone on in Gujarat since 2002 in particular. Working on uh, environment and energy policy, there aren't any nice black and white answers. Everything is various shades of grey. Mm -hmm. and. You know, it's, it's tricky. There's no, not going to be any single silver bullet. Liz, it was great fun to chat with you today. Thanks so much for coming on my show. No, this was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, really, really wonderful to work through a lot of these questions with you. If you enjoyed this podcast, please spread the news among your friends and share it on social media. The Twitter handle for this podcast is Global Dev Pod. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to in pursuit of development at gmail.com. 